Hey gang, Scott Davenport here. So in this video, we're gonna talk about copyright. I got a bunch of questions about copyright uh, during my first vlog. And so finally sitting down to cover, you know, at least my process, what I'm doing with it. This, this won't be an exhaustive video of, you know, 57 steps to file your application and so forth. There are a lot of different resources already out there. And I wanna cover uh, some things that I think are um, either uh, useful knowledge in general or specifics about the application that might trip you up. And so I'll make sure to cover those things. I'm actually going to cover four things in this video. You know, one is what to register. Two is how to stay organized. Three is the tips and tricks about the application process itself. And then fourth will be monitoring, you know, finding out is your work being infringed upon. Now, before we get into all that, I want to preface this with a couple of things. First, this is only for US copyright. I don't know what the laws are in other countries, but uh, I suspect there'll be some similarities. But you know, so if you're not in the US, you're welcome to watch, take this with you know, uh, a grain of salt as it were, so that you're not applying some, uh, something wrong for your country of origin. And secondly, there is another video I want you to go check out after this. It's uh, over at F-Stoppers, and they have a they have part of a course that they put together about making money with photography. And one of those ways is, you know, following up on copyright infringements. There's a great video, lots of good uh, stories and details about why you care about registering. And so uh, I want you to check that one out as well. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. I guess the last thing, too, is I'm not a lawyer, so... Uh, this is not legal advice. This is me sharing my advice on my process, how I register photos, and why I do things the way that I do. I think it'll resonate with a lot of you that are either enthusiasts or not, you know, not creating prolific amounts of work. You're creating you know, smaller sets of photos, but good ones, and you want to register them and protect yourself. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into it. All right, so first up is registering your work, deciding what to register, how to register, and so forth. So the first question I get a lot is, should I bother with this? It seems like a headache. It seems like a hassle. Don't I own the copyright when I take the photo? You do. You own the copyright when you press the button on the camera. Uh, why you want to register the work is uh, if you're going to pursue someone for an infringement, you're, it's going to be crystal clear you own the photo. And you can also go for what's called, I think, statutory damages, mainly more money if you know that's what you're going after. But really for me, it's it eliminates any sort of question about who owns the photo. It's my photo, it's registered, and if you do end up in some type of um, legal proceeding or you know a demand letter or whatever it might be, it's crystal clear. And you know honestly the, the lawyer side of the house, they, they love it because it's it's really just straightforward. There is no question. So I do think you should register your work. Now when you're registering, deciding on what to register. So how I do it is I only register photos that I have published. And uh, there's two reasons that works for me. First is I do a fair amount of post-processing on my images. And so the final photo may look very different from the original capture from the camera. So I need to register that final produced work. And I don't want to sit and wait until I've gotten through a copyright registration before I share that work with the world. So I publish my photos and I'll explain how I track that in my, uh, in my asset manager. And then I will register batches of my published work. Uh, you can also register unpublished photos. That's totally fine. As of uh, mid-February of 2018, you're limited to 750 in a batch. So if you're shooting weddings or you're shooting sports, it costs money because uh, for 750 images, you pay 55 bucks. If you have you know, several thousand, well, then it's going to cost you more money. So um, the other thing about like grouping your work, try to group your work into, I'll call them like families of work. And what I mean by that is either everything is published or everything is unpublished, uh, everything in the same year. It makes it slightly easier if you have uh, doing published work, if you've published them all to the same location. And so uh, my process is I always share photos to my website first. Uh, everything goes to my website and then it might have to be five minutes later when it hits Facebook or Instagram or some other social media site. That's okay. The first publication happened on my website, and this just makes the application process a little bit easier. So uh, key things here is to just you know group your work, 
And uh, if you're publishing, I'm oh, sorry, if you're registering published photos, I recommend publishing them to uh, one location first and then letting it span out from there. One other thought about the published work, and this will this kind of bleeds into the second topic about tracking your work, is for full protection of your images, you have a 90-day window from publishing a photo to having uh, losing full protection. And what that means is like, you know, the, the full power and you know, statutory damages and all the other stuff that goes along with collecting on any type of infringement. So when you publish a photo, the clock is ticking. And so what I do with my publications is I copyright them five times a year. I batch up things every 75 days. So I'm giving myself a 15 day window. So I'll track when I've published things. Let's start at the beginning of the year. January 1st, I start publishing photos. And then by March 15th, anything I've published between January 1st and March 15th, that's a batch that gets registered. I'm within the 90 day window of my first published work, January 1st. And I've got full protection, you know, legally for all the photos. And if anybody, you know, I, I would love it if like, you know, Exxon Mobil or something <laughs> took my photo, I'd be able to go and get, you know, full restitution from them. So, um, yeah, let me sum that up here. So for, you know, grouping your work, make it a family of work, either all unpublished, all published, all same year. And if you're registering published works, make sure you start your application within 90 days of the photo being first published. The well, second thing is staying organized, keeping track of what you have registered with the Copyright Office and what things have completed that process and you've got your registration done. So if you're doing unpublished photos, that's relatively straightforward. Collect all the unpublished photos you want to register into a batch, again, up to 750 of them. Put them into a collection or an album, and then that becomes you know, the, the set of unpublished works you're going to register. If you're doing for published works, well, you have a little more tracking to do and there's a little more information that you need to, to maintain. You need to know certainly what photo is it that you're registering. So that same idea of having a collection for something that you've published and you want to register. But the second thing is also knowing the day that it was published. And that's important. That will be asked for on the publication or the, uh, the registration application. I want to show you what I do here in, in Lightroom as my asset manager. And so I have a collection and to be registered and I have a bunch of different batches of things to do. And here for 2018, I've got 50 photos that are coming up that I have published. I've put all of these online through my website and I wanna make sure they're registered before that 90 day window closes. So as I prepare all of my posts for my website, let's like pick this image here. In the IPTC area of the metadata, I use this little instructions field to mark when did I publish this photo. And so later on, when it's time for me to grab all of these photos and prepare the application, I have a record of it. Yes, I could go back and weed through all of the blog posts or you know, gallery updates or whatever it is that I've done on my website, but that takes a lot of time. I'm sitting here and I'm working and getting all of those posts prepared. I'll keep track of it as I do it. So when it comes to that 75 day thing, I do this five times a year. I'm going to spend a few minutes in Lightroom and I collect all this information. But it makes it simpler. It's less legwork for me on the back end. Um, you know, it's do little bits of things along the way and save yourself a bunch of time later. So keeping track of when you published is important if you are registering published works. And uh, after that, uh, I'm going to show you the, the application screen in a moment. But when you first open up the, the application screen, you will get a case number assigned once you submit your application for registration. So if we take a look over at things that I have put into the registration process, you can see I have these different tags on here. There's these VAs and there's cases. So the case, like this one here for 2016, I have still a pending case that has not cleared through the application process. I get a case number, I stick that into my collection ID. When I finally get the registration completed, I add this VA number, like this guy here, so that I know an association with the photos that I have finished my registration on, there is my copyright registration number that goes with it. 
And I also embed that into the photo. I use that job identifier field to say, I've got this thing registered. And if it's got a VA number, it's cleared. So in the future, if I have an infringement, I can quickly and easily pull up which copyright you know, identifier is associated with this photo. And I provide that to whoever's helping me out on the legal side of things. And so it's a bit of work. It's not free, but it will pay off if you're chasing down infringers. So that's uh, staying organized. So summing that up, make sure you've got a collection or an album for your set that you're registering. In some way, shape, or form, embed the case number or the, you know, the final registration number with not only the collection, but also the photos. And if you're doing published works, make sure you are tracking the day that you published the photo. Now let's talk about some tips for the application process itself. The first thing is you want to go to eco.copyright.gov. Set yourself up with an account there. It's like any other you know, website that you've signed up for before where you put in certain personal information, your mailing address, and so forth. I'll say the website's a little dated. You know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not modern. It is the government. It moves a little bit slower. But fundamentally, you know, it's navigatable. You, get, you can get your way around there. And once you're ready to register, when you open up a new application, there's a bunch of different things you need to fill in. Most of it is very self-explanatory, you know, adding yourself as the contact, adding yourself as the copyright owner, and so forth. I want to point out a few of the screens that tripped me up when I first was registering work. And once I got these understood and cleaned up, my registrations are really a lot smoother and they're usually turned around within, you know, within a month. So this is, the, this is the main screen when you're doing an application. You've got all these different segments of work. So for photography, type of work is a work of the visual arts. Pretty straightforward, right? Now the titles, that's really where you need to pay the most attention. So for titles, if you are registering a group of photos, you either have a group of published or unpublished photos, and then if it's published, specifying exactly what range those photos were published in. And this format is very, very important. The Copyright Office is very particular on it. So you want to say, as it's shown here on the screen, group registration of published photos, comma, published, and then the date it was first published to the date it was last published. Because you've got you know, a set of, let's say, 50 images. In this particular application, I filed, or I sorry, I published the first photo on January 2nd, and I published the last photo on March 31st. So actually, it was really tight on that 90-day window there. I cut it close on this particular application. Now, this in and of itself is not enough. You also need to provide what are called contents titles. So you know this is the title of the work being registered. You want to also add content titles. So we did title the work. This part here, content titles. This is going to be all of the photos that you are registering. I mean, I've got a few pasted on my clipboard here. And so what I have is I have the title or the name, my file name of my photo, followed by the date that it was published, and then a semicolon. Again, this formatting is very important. Now, where did all this data come from? Well, it came from my asset manager. Now, I have a certain file naming scheme that I use, and when I export the photos, I append a title to the file name, and I already recorded the publish date. So I need to assemble this information when I'm getting ready to put together my application for copyright. Now, contents title field usually limits it to about 10 to 12 entries. So if you have more than that many photos, which is pretty typical, I can save this contents title. You'll see there'll be a list of photos here. And I can create a second one. So I can add another one. And I'll just duplicate this for now for the illustrative purposes. And you can do as many of those as you need until you've covered all of your photos. And if you paste in too many, too many characters, or whatever the limit is on these fields, you know, the tool won't let you save it. That just tells you, all right, I've, I've tried to put too many, too many content titles into a single uh, you know, input box. I need to break that up a little bit. Generally for me, about 10 per contents title works. And since I'm only registering between 50 and 100 photos at a time, it's not too painful. You know, it takes a few extra minutes, but we get through it. So it's really important you have both the group title, so the group of your photos, as well as the contents title to delineate each individual photo that is part of its set. And again, if it's published works, not only the name of the photo, but also the day that it was published. 
The next section for publication and completion, the main important thing to add in here is the year and the date. Now again, I'm registering published works, so it's the year that these were published and the first publication date of the set of photos that I'm registering. Now, authors and claimants, this is going to be you. And the tool makes it pretty easy. Here's authors. I can just click Add Me. Now, you set up your account. You've put in your personal information. You just hit Add Me. It'll add you in, and you move on to the next segment. That is the same for claimants, for rights and permissions, for correspondence, where to mail the certificate. All of these various things have an Add Me button. Let me cover the other areas just so you can see each segment that's not just a simple Add Me. So limitation of claim. I never check any of these things. I don't have previous registrations. I'm registering for myself. It's not you know, another corporation or anything like that. So for an individual, you're just registering photos for yourself and leave all this stuff blank. Special handling. I tend not to do any of this. Uh, I'm not in a rush to get these registrations done. Once I submit this case, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've satisfied that 90-day window. If the Copyright Office takes a year to get me a final registration, that's okay. I've got a case number and I'll be good to go for, uh, for any, any type of litigation that may arise. Last, of course, you know, you certify, yes, this is all my stuff. And then the end of it, you'll review the submission and eventually you'll submit the payment. Again, $55 for an application. The payment usually takes you to a different website momentarily. You make your payments and then you come back to the ECO site. The last step is to upload your work. Now, uploading the work, uh, again, I'm going to go return over to Lightroom and show you what I use there. There's two things you want to upload, or two things you can upload. One is you can just upload a simple contact sheet, which is you know really a PDF of all your photos. Or secondarily, you can upload small versions of the photos. So let me get back over to Lightroom, and I'll go back into my 2018 batch. And so I can select all of these. And if I want to make a contact sheet and go over to the print module. And I have something set up called contact sheet. And so this just does, you know, simple contact sheet, gives the name of the file there. And I can print this out as a PDF and include it in my application. And that's how I've been doing things traditionally. More recently, I've also been adding in small versions of the photo. So back over to the library. This is all standard fair stuff, right? I'd go in here and I'd choose export. And then I would use something small, like uh, let's see, I'd probably export with file and title. But I would change my size here to like maybe 400 pixels, right? It doesn't need to be a large scale image, it just needs to be enough representative. Now, why do I do the export as JPEGs as well as the contact sheet? Well, as I export them JPEGs, that also embeds my contact copyright information, all of that into the file. And that is now also in the Copyright Office's hands. And so if someone's ever taken the photo and stripped out the metadata or done something funny there, it's no longer just my word against someone else's. There's a third party that has my photo and it happens to be the Copyright Office and they've got the metadata there. So it's just an extra level of protection. It, it doesn't cost me more than a minute or so to do it. The files are small, the upload is easy. So contact sheet as well as small JPEGs um, works great. You can even skip the contact sheet quite honestly, but that's the kind of a vestige of my process. So summing all that up, for you know, tips and tricks for the application. Make sure you have a group title as well as contents title. That is by far the thing that people get hung up on the most and formatting matters. There is a guide on the ECO website that describes those formats that you know, need to be there. I'll put examples of those in the show notes as well. And then make sure you upload copies of your work, contact sheet or small scale JPEGs of each of the photos in the set that you're registering. Now, last but not least is monitoring your work. You've gone to the trouble of registering your photos with the Copyright Office. Eventually you get a nice piece of paper that comes back and says your photos are registered and you've got it uh, all, you know, everything all buttoned up. Well, you know, what if someone infringes on your work? How do you find out about this stuff? Well, there's a few ways to do it. Uh, you know, one is just by luck. You happen to stumble across your photo and you see it being used inappropriately. 
And I've heard stories about that. There's actually a really good story in that F-Stoppers uh, tutorial that I mentioned. Um, fascinating story, quite honestly. Uh, but the, um, the other ways are to use the power of the internet and do reverse lookups on your images. You can do that with Google. You just take any one of your photos and drag it over into the Google interface, and then it will go try to find matches to that photo. Uh, another way is to use some type of service that will do the monitoring for you. And that's how I go. I use a service called Pixie, P-I-X-S-Y. Uh, they don't pay me to say this. They're awesome. Matter of fact, I pay them to help me out. And the reason I like Pixie is it, the, they do the, uh, the scanning and you know, matching of, of photos automatically for me, but also they have partnerships with various law firms to help out if there is a case for infringement. It's really very minimal work on my part. I don't have a lawyer on retainer because I honestly don't have that many copyright infringements. You know, I'm not a commercial photographer. I'm not doing, you know, like, you know, weddings or, or any type of high fashion or things that, you know, might, uh, might demand a, a higher price tag or, or something where I'm getting uh, infringed on enough that I need to have a lawyer. So Pixie has that, uh, that arrangement and relationship. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the, the Pixie interface here, and then I'll come back and talk a little more about you know, some of the, the homework you need to do before you open up a case. So this is what um, Pixie looks like, and these are the photos that I have provided to the, the service. And so after I've done registering a set with the copyright office, I'll take those, uh, and these are a little larger JPEG, maybe like, you know, a 1024 size. I'll go click import photos and I'll upload selected images. I'll actually just do a, um, a, a flat out upload. I'm not going to do, um, you know, I'm not trying to do these, you know, adding it from the websites or connecting with these services. That works okay, but by far my best experience has been for me to directly upload the photos into Pixie. They've got the original that try not trying to do, you know, drags across URLs or anything like that. It works the best just to upload them uh, straight up into Pixie. And then once that's done, you know, periodically you'll get these emails from Pixie and say, you know, here's, here's the matches. Now, right now I've actually cleaned house. I've gone through and I've checked all the different matches and I've weeded out the ones that don't matter. But the really cool thing is you get this slider here and by default, it sets it reasonably conservatively because there's lots of different matches out there. If I scroll this thing all the way down to the very end, I'm going to start to see all sorts of strange matches come up. And I've got, okay, this, this photo I took, somebody put on their, looks like their LinkedIn profile and looks like they did it a bunch of times, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. You start scrolling through, you start to see matches that aren't necessarily a clean match. Obviously someone else took the same photo of the same piece of street art that I did you know, these don't really match at all. They just have similar tones. And so this slider at the very top, you know, this is, this is good to have where it's defaulted to somewhere in the middle. And you get a reasonable balance between stuff that doesn't make sense for a match and stuff that you do want to pay attention to. Now, here's the thing with matches. You will find a fair number of false positives. You know, the, the algorithms do an okay job. If you have a photo of a popular landmark, say the Eiffel Tower, you're going to get tons of matches on that. It's, you know, the Eiffel Tower has a distinctive shape, and you know, there are only so many different angles you can take on that thing, and everybody's taking photos of it. So expect to find a lot of matches for that, and you know, that might be one of those photos that it's fine to register it, but you may not be really seeking uh, you know, some type of um, infringement case on that. There'd be a lot of false positives to weed through. Uh, another thing you need to be aware of is if you are putting your photos into stock sites, you know, Stocksy, um, Offset, um, I forget what, whatever, Adobe Stock Service, whatever it might be. Well, someone may have legitimately purchased the rights to use your photo. And it's up to you to, to check that before you open up a case saying, so-and-so infringed on me because they may have properly, legally licensed your photo. So you have to do some of that homework as well. Um, one other thought about, about the matches is I'll get a fair amount of matches for people that just have, you know, personal blogs or things like that. And I usually just reach out to them directly and say, hey, can you credit me on the photo and link back to my website? I'm not going to go after somebody who, you know, like I remember one was uh, someone had a, a blog about uh, yoga and one of my sunrise photos was on there. And I'm not gonna go after the person who's just talking about yoga. Chances are, even if I were to legally go seek out this person, 
you know, there's one thing to be, you know, getting a judgment that says, yes, they infringed. It's a totally different thing to actually expect to get any payment out of that. So I bias toward the commercial things. If it's a business, if it's someone whose website's their business and they're using my photos, yeah, I'm going to open up an infringement case and I'm going to, you know, you know, get some type of restitution at it because you didn't legally license my photo. Uh, what else about matches? Um, you'll also see image aggregators show up quite a bit in any of these matching tools. Well, that's what aggregators are doing. They're going out and trolling around and finding, you know, pictures in Italy that are blue. And if you have a photo that matches that, your photo might show up. There is really no entity to go after that. It's an algorithm. So you need to be a little selective. There's a bit of homework to do when you're checking up on things. But I found Pixie makes it pretty darn easy to handle that and uh, with, with few to no false positives. And I spend maybe, maybe a half an hour a week, and that's probably being generous, to go through the matches to see if there's anything that I need to follow up on. All right, well, we, we made it to the end here. Um, I know this was a longer video, and I wanted to make sure I did uh, due diligence on the topic. There were a lot of questions that I'd gotten from folks about copyright. I think it sometimes still feels a little mysterious, and uh, hopefully this demystified a fair amount of it for you. You know, to, to kind of extract the really key points, it's those content titles that people get hung up on. So, uh, you know, group title and content title, you got to have those things together. If you're doing published works, get them into the registration process within 90 days of publishing that photo so you get the full protection. And then use some type of service to really do the monitoring. You can do it yourself, and then you're also going to be chasing down people by yourself. Pixie is great. Again, they don't pay me to say that. Their plan is free. You can have, I think, up to 5,000 images in their system for free. And you know it's wonderful because they have the backing and the relationship with legal people, you know, the legal arm of things. And it makes it very easy for photographers to get restitution on infringements. So um, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if this was helpful to you. If you have other questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but I can at least speak from experience and give you the advice of how I've done things uh, in the past or how I might alter things based on new experiences that I have in the world of copyright and copyright infringement. Well, until next time, my name is Scott Davenport. Hope you've enjoyed this. I'll see you again soon.